It's good to worship, isn't it? It's good to worship. Please be seated. <clears throat> this uh, fellowship is a very special fellowship. If you're visiting or you're new to it, uh, it's a very special place, special people, uh, special times that we gather and we worship and uh, we articulate our great need for a great Savior. I have visited many churches. I actually cut my teeth on the pews at church. I mean, I, I was raised in church. My father and my mother were very active in church. Uh, it started out as a small church, the church I grew up in. It grew to be a, a mega church of 2,600 people. It was an exciting time. And then I went off to university, and I was enlisted right away to perform and to play. And so I got to visit many, many churches in the Los Angeles region over those five years. And then I, I, I moved to San Diego and I, I gigged at different churches and I found a little church that I played uh, a, a role in as a choir director and uh, that was very special. And uh, then I moved to South Lake Tahoe, tried a number of other churches out and uh, then moved to Sacramento and I, I played in a lot of other churches. I got a, a great feel for churches in the area. I remember one church in particular though that made me really sad. And what made it so sad was the fact that it was a church that um, purposely, intentionally, exclusively catered to uh, older people. Uh, there was no room for children. In fact, there was no thought given to child evangelism or outreach. Uh, young families weren't, there was nothing for young families, no programs during the course of the week. There was nothing. All there was was Sunday morning and that was it. And uh, so could you picture that? Could you picture how sad it would be for church fellowship not to have children's musicals, uh, especially at like Christmas? W wouldn't that be sad? Or to have no discipleship programs throughout the week, no youth groups, no, no winter retreats, no summer camps, no children being encouraged to come to Christ or no, no uh, mentoring between adults uh, leading these children into, into a knowledge and a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. May it never be said of this fellowship. Can I get an amen with that? May it never be said that we neglect the children and the youth in our community. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, life giver, sustainer, what a joy it is to be able to freely call upon you this morning. What a privilege it is to declare your goodness and your tender mercies towards us. Father, quicken our minds this morning. Awaken us from our sluggish thoughts and our willful ignorance. Father, may we see our sinfulness, our selfishness, and be swift to confess and repent of it. Father, focus our thinking. Grant us clarity. Help us to discern your will and your heart. May we not be distracted by our own opinions or ideas. Give us eyes to see not only the folly of our ways, but also the path to your desired outcome. Awaken our affections. Move us to care about the things that are close to your heart. May we be able to know the difference between our will and and your will, and empower us to choose your will first time every time. Tenderize our consciences. If faulty thinking exists, Father, may you, by way of your Holy Spirit, confront us and convict us in our folly and move us into your truth and your light and your life. Father, put in our hearts this craving for your presence, a longing for your holiness. Father, we recognize that our only hope lies in you. You are our hope and the hope of the children that will follow. I ask that you would call us to yourself and to what you've called us to. Lord, we seek your will and your way, especially when it comes to ministering to the children in our midst and the children who will be coming into our fellowship in the future. And so, Lord, I pray that your light would illuminate all that is dark, that, Father, you would give us a heart for what is close to you. Sure up all the things that are unstable in our thinking. 
Father, evaporate all the confusion and distortion we may be holding on to. May we be found as people who are dependent, but also expectant, open and accommodating, so that you may accomplish in us and through us all that you desire. I pray, God, that you would enable me now to speak in such a way that your people can understand and that they can hear. May every word have impact and power, not because I say it, but because it is grounded in the truth of who you are. May this message be delivered in your spirit and received with trusting and believing hearts by your people. And it's in your holy, supreme, and matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray these things. Amen. So we find ourselves in the book of Mark this morning. Mark 10, 13 through 16. Open your Bibles, if you would. We'll also have it up on the screen. But I'd like you to, to follow along. I'm going to go bit by bit, part by part. And I want you to follow along and engage with me as we look into, intently look into the Scriptures this morning. And so here is Mark 11, 13 through 16. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. So we see a picture of the disciples, and they are rebuking the crowd as the crowd are bringing their children to Jesus. You could say that Jesus' disciples here were well-intentioned dragons. Or another way of saying it might be overzealous gatekeepers, or maybe exuberant bodyguards of Jesus. But they were, they were playing a role that was rather insensitive to what was really going on around them. They were unaware at best and unsympathetic at worst to the needs and the desires and the hopes of the parents as well as to the children. And why is this? Well, could it be that the disciples uh, didn't have children of their own, didn't have families of their own, that they didn't value children Uh, Could it be that they just didn't understand children? Uh, Could it be that they were just gruff old guys or young men who had worked the fishing uh, industry and they just had hard hearts? Could that be? I don't know. I really don't. I mean, we we can't read into the text that much. But I do know this one thing. I know that the disciples were ignorant of the heart and the work and the target audience at that time that Jesus had. They missed it completely. The disciples were quick to assume uh, that Jesus had an intended way about him, that they they assumed that he had a plan, and that the, the children weren't engaged or were necessary to accomplish that. They perhaps were not thoughtful of the master's work and the way and his ways. Certainly they were blinded by their, their sinfulness. This was a, a sinful thing that they did. They were probably completely unaware of it as well. Perhaps they got caught up in their own work, in their own ways, and they fell into the trap of, of protecting those things. How easy it is uh, to miss the ways and the works of the Lord. So the disciples, they were quick to assume that they knew what Jesus was doing or what he needed or especially what might annoy or bother him. They were controlling others. If you'll notice too, it was the weak ones. It was the vulnerable ones, probably because it was easier for them to do that. I don't know. But they were exerting their power in such a way that was denying these families, these children, what was good. If only they had remembered uh, the, the passage in Proverbs that reads this, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. 
when it is in your power to do it. The disciples, perhaps, they had an inflated view of themselves. After all, they had been walking around with the rabbi Jesus who was doing miraculous works and healing people and speaking things that were so intelligent and thoughtful. Per perhaps they were concerned about how they were being perceived by others and especially the other disciples in whom they were in competition with. Maybe they were competing with the other disciples and they, who's going to be the most loyal to, to Jesus? Who... Who's going to be the best guardian of Jesus? Who's, who's going to be the greatest amongst them? In fact, we know that that was part of their issue because we remember back to a couple sermons about that very thing. Don't you recall, uh, perhaps, I don't know how many months ago was it that, that we were in the book of Mark and Jesus confronted his disciples about the argument that they were having as they were walking along the way about who was the greatest amongst themselves? Do you remember that? And, and do you remember how Jesus corrected them, how he rebuked them in a sense, and, and, and how he did it? In, in Mark 9, 35 and 37, it should be right behind me. Let me just read this pass, uh, with you. It says this, and he sat down and called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Uh, this would include children. And he took a child and put this child in the midst of them and Taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives such one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. And clearly the disciples had forgotten this vivid object lesson in this moment, coming back to the text that we're looking at this morning. They had forgotten this, this, this lesson that Jesus had taught them. And, and could it be that the disciples just didn't want to be bothered with the messiness of the moment, these families, these children? Honestly, can, can you relate at all with these disciples a little bit? I, at full honesty, I sure can. Um, I can vividly recall instances uh, when I have said no purposely to my children or to my Marcy because I either didn't have the capacity at that moment to deal with the issue, or two, I just didn't want to exert any energy to think about the needs and the concerns that they had. I was being completely selfish in that moment. Didn't want to get messy with that situation. Also in complete uh, vulnerability here, I hope you guys will uh, show me grace as, as time goes on, but I'm a messy guy sometimes. I mean, I just got these sin issues. I just, maybe it's good to confess them, lay them right out there for you. But I am quick to place my desire to be comfortable, to be in control, to not be inconvenienced above the well-being and benefit of others, especially the most needy ones around me, many times. I effortlessly choose what I think is right impulsively instead of discerning with care, with thought, what Jesus might be doing in that particular situation. Am I alone in that? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sometimes I just get so caught up in, by the manner and the rhythm of my task or my work at hand that I am just simply unwilling to release my focus to serve others, especially my family. And often I allow the thought of what others might think about me, which is a big thing for my personality type. I care way too much about what other people think about me. And I let that dictate my attention and care away from my family and the people that need me most in that moment. We are often, more often, sorry, we are more often than not completely unaware and absolutely ignorant in seeing and identifying these sinful coping strategies that we employ. We have so many sinful coping mechanisms. It's just ridiculous. If you were just to sit back and reflect on what you do and why you do it, you would, you would quickly see all of these things that we do to isolate ourselves, probably from the the pain that we might experience or, or the things that we do to protect uh, the interests that we have or that we hold 
or we do things sinfully uh, in order to manipulate others, just in order to control the outcome that we desire. And, and why is this? Why? What's our biggest issue? It's sin. <laughs> we have a sinful nature. We, we, no one is immune to it. And, and, and this is the unvarnished truth here. This is from Jeremiah 17, 9. It says this, the heart, the seat of emotions, the very being of who we are, the, the heart is deceitful above all things and it is desperately sick. Who can understand it? This is why it's a tremendous gift when our sin, our sinful strategies are revealed to us. And how are they revealed to us? Many times they're revealed to us in, in, by the Holy Spirit, could whisper in our ear, our conscience could convict us. And God's Word, as we read through it, can also speak truth into our lives and convict us that way. Sometimes it's through difficult situations where our faith is challenged or perhaps we're caught in our sin in particular situations and our sin is exposed and we find ourselves suddenly humiliated and 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 we're embarrassed by that other times it could be that people come beside us and and lovingly carefully confront us and admonish us about our sin and when this happens boy my thinking has changed now we're no longer cursed but we're blessed because of it it's a blessing. It's a blessing because it leads us to a place when we're confronted with our sin, we can see it for what it is and we can, we can confess of it. We can tell the truth about it. We can repent of it. We can be forgiven of it. And not only just re forgiven, but then also restored back into fellowship with God, back into fellowship with one another. It's a blessing when, when our sin is revealed to us. Psalm 32, 1 and 2, this is a great, it's one of the penitent psalms. This is when David had been called out by the prophet Nathan in his great sin against Uriah and Bathsheba and God Almighty. And he said these words, blessed, that is at peace, joy-filled, is the one whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no in iniquity. That is, he's right with God, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. There's a clear conscience. Blessed is the man who is in that position. When we're confronted and corrected, when our sin is revealed, as humbling, by the way, as that, that moment may be. Guess what? It is a restorative gift. It's a blessing from God. And as it was in that moment for the disciples... Jesus was, was correcting, so it is also for us today. And why is rebuke and confrontation, correction and admonishment not only a blessing, but it's also a necessity for a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, because it is because we're being trained in righteousness. We're learning what it is to, to walk with Christ, to be right. It's, it's part of the process that we're all in. It's the process of sanctification. We're being made holy. We're not just left as in a certain place. No, we are progressing. This is God's will for us. God's word does this. God's people does this. God's spirit leads us. In this particular text, it's God's word. All scripture, you're familiar with this passage, 1 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable, as meaning it, 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 it has value for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And why is that? Why? Well, it's that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work and so we receive teaching we receive reproof we receive correction as a very good thing and by the way if you're in this process right now know that you are being trained in righteousness because you are a true child of God he is doing this with purpose well let's get back to the text for a moment this is Mark 10 Coming back to the text, and they, the crowd, this is the crowd, they were bringing the children to Jesus that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked the crowd, the children. But when Jesus saw it, when he saw the disciples behaving the way that they were, using the words that they were using, he was indignant, and he said to them, he spoke to the disciples. And so Jesus, when he saw it, he was indignant. 
when Jesus saw his disciples and they were running interference and, and they were keeping the children and the parents from coming to Jesus, he, he actually literally became angry. There was, there was a passion about him. There was, there was an energy about him that was screaming, this is wrong, this is not right, it must be fixed immediately. Why? Again, just to state the obvious, it was because the disciples had obstructed the pathway of the children to Jesus himself. But the account doesn't just leave the disciples in a rebuked, corrected state. Aren't you thankful? As we read this scripture, we see that Jesus not only gives discipline, but he also gives direction. He both corrects and then he directs. You see this in verse 8. It says, but when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And then he said to them, the disciples, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. Let the children, let them come to me freely. Let them come. Don't hinder them. So we see this, that we see Jesus giving direction after he is given correction in that moment. We, we see also, if, if I was thinking about how this also was, I could see patterns in scripture. I, I could see Jesus, he became indignant a couple other times where he had to give correction and direction. Do you remember when Jesus went into the temple and they were selling and exchanging money for animals and they were doing all of this in the place where the Gentiles could worship? It was, uh, an ex they were exchanging money, they were doing these sorts of things and Jesus was filled with, with righteous indignation and he immediately began to turn over tables and disrupt the sinful patterns that had been established in the temple. He, 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 he did this. Now, Mark 11, 15 through 17 gives this account. We're going to read it. It says, And they, Jesus and the disciples, came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. So here's the correction. That's what he was doing. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who had sold pigeons... Here's the direction now. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? It's both Gentiles and Jews. But you have made it a den of robbers. See how he gives this, this correction and this direction. Jesus did it twice. He went into the temple twice, did the same things. The first time at the beginning of his ministry, and then the second time near the end of his ministry. And what can we learn from this? What, what, what can we draw as truth from this? Well, the big takeaway is simply this. When people are of influence in particular impede the worship of others, the worship of the living God, the worship of Yahweh, the worship of Jesus, guess what? Jesus becomes indignant. And, and said a different way as well, we could also say this, I'm going to say this, it is sinful then to obstruct or to make things burdensome or difficult for people to worship the Lord. And I would add this specifically children specifically children. And so Jesus said to his disciples, coming back to the text of the moment, let the children come to me, do not hinder them. So here's my question for you. Don't say it out loud, unless you really want to, but th think about this in your mind just for a moment. Let's be thoughtful about this. How are some of the ways that, that we, or you specifically, hinder children from learning about and worshiping Jesus Christ? What are some of the things that we do, either intentionally or unintentionally, that actually keep children away, keep youth away from learning about and growing in a knowledge of Jesus Christ? I gave this some thought as I was thinking through some of the things that I do or that I have seen done. And I think... Um, one of the main things is just by example. 
Uh, let's, let's think about home life for a moment. Let's think about family life. Those of you that are not married yet, be thinking about this because someday you will be, and, and being parent is very, very important. And so think about this. The family is the microcosm. This is the small church. This is, this is what we are called to shepherd as, as adults, as parents. We are shepherding our children. And many times we hinder the children living under our roofs from coming to Christ simply because we don't model well. We don't model uh, a faith in Christ Jesus that is sincere. We aren't true-faced. We aren't truly devoted. Uh, we live undisciplined lives. We are impulsive in the way that we make decisions or the way that we process things. And by doing so, then we actually hinder our children from Christ. Another way that we hinder our children from from uh, knowing Christ, of, of being uh, focused on Christ, is when we allow technology even to dominate and capture our attention. I mean, really, how can we seriously proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light when we are enthralled, when we are captivated by, say, Facebook or YouTube or Instagram or the news. By the way, let me just as a way of confession here, Tom mentioned, Pastor Tom mentioned something about that during the service with the 4T uh, service. And I immediately uh, tapped out and got rid of a couple of my apps that I've been spending way too much time on. One was my Facebook app. I don't need that on here. I don't need checking my Facebook status every 10 minutes. Another one, uh, YouTube, I got rid of YouTube. I even went as far as to get rid of my news feed. I don't need that stuff. It's a distraction. It takes me away from my, my high and holy calling to parent my children, to be in the game, to be aware of what's going on. I would encourage some of you too, if you have issues with technology, get rid of stuff that you don't need. It's distracting you from what's most important, which is your family, which is your children some thoughts uh so technology detox essentially um also uh purposely unplug i'm just giving you some practical ideas right now by the way too uh purposely unplug on a specific night just to open up your your board game closet and pull out a game and play cards with your kids do something with your children that, that kind of interaction is so important not only to build relationships but also to talk about serious faith issues um, also keep keep track of the time that you spend uh, very very important especially on your media devices um, another way we hinder our children from coming to Christ is when we uh, take a very passive posture with our children re regarding their behavior and we don't discipline them at all we don't hold them accountable at all um, look we got to be actively engaged in our with our children, confronting them about sin, which sometimes is a little awkward and difficult, but I would encourage you parents to, to get in there in the trenches and confront them and to discipline them accordingly, uh, to focus on the heart more than actually behavior modification. Ask questions about what, how they're feeling, what they're doing, um, what their condition of their heart is spiritually before the Lord. Um, at, while you're doing so too to be transparent to honestly confess your own sin to them to to share with them some of the things that you're struggling with so that way they know that they're not alone that that you can relate to them at that very basic level and that you can work your somebody perhaps some of the strategies that you're using to correct uh, some of the the sin issues in your own life but what i'm trying to say is to be as transparent as possible with your children with your spouse no secrets. Keep everything above board. Let everybody know that you, what, the face that you wear before them is the face that you always wear no matter where you are. And so it's my encouragement to you to be a model, to model well to your children, to your spouse. Another way we hinder our children from coming to Christ is when we rush through bedtime. This is something I never really had an issue with because I love bedtime, only because I could, I could sing to my children. I could read them uh, books. I could share God, the gospel with them. I could hear their hearts. But, you know, it's, it's so easy to be consumed with our own projects, our own issues, that we just let the kids put themselves to bed. 
themselves. And I would encourage you parents to sit with your children, to read scripture with them, find a, 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 a translation of God's word that they can understand. Uh, spend time with them. Pray sincerely too. I, I remember I, I was uh, rented a room in a, in a house. These people were fantastic, but it was really interesting at dinner time because uh, they always had the standard uh, dinner prayer. You know what I'm talking about? It wasn't as lame as rub a dub dub, thanks for the grub, but it was similar to that. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was a certain couplets and, uh, and, and a litany that just kind of flowed and it was very, very easy. And I would encourage you to not get stuck in ruts. Okay? Do not get stuck in ruts. Uh, when you pray for dinner, pray about certain things. Get in tune with it. One of the things I would remember, I, I, was, I was hooked on, uh, this, is, this is manna from heaven, Father. Thank you. So I was thinking, I was looking around on the food that was before us. It was all gifted food. It was just amazing to me. And I just remembered, oh, thank you, Lord, for, for showing us your grace and your mercy in this moment. Nothing formulaic about that, just all sincere. And so when you pray with your children, be sure to be as sincere as possible and as creative and, and uh, unique in a manner that they know that you're just not going through the motions. So that way they can emulate that in their own lives. There, it's nothing more tragic than to have kids and they're still just formulaically praying the Lord's Prayer. There's no thought, there's no, it's just kind of a superstitious thing that they do at night. No, no, you want to break them from that and to think, be thoughtful about a prayer, to be sincere about it. Another way we hinder our children from uh, coming to Christ and to knowing Him and knowing His Word is when we don't take advantage of uh, mealtime gatherings. Um, I, I've already mentioned this already, but just as far as praying sincerely around the table, uh, another thing that we do on occasion is is actually just opening God's word right there. In fact, we have uh, friends that we are, we spend some time with on occasion, and it's without a doubt every time we get together, they after dinner they open the word and they read the word together, and it's just fantastic. And so I would just encourage you to make that part of the rhythm of life around your table uh, with under your roof. Make every opportunity count. That's what I'm saying. And not just for your kids, but also your kids' as friends. Your kids' friends. I used to drive a Jeep Wrangler. I loved this Jeep. Man, this was a great Jeep. It was so great. Uh, loved it. And I remember when Marcy and I were talking, because our family was expanding, and we realized that we need to get a larger car, not just for our own children, but for also their friends. And I was at that point of going... Serenity now, serenity. Okay, I, can, I will be more than happy, and I was sincere about this. I will give up the Jeep. That's okay. And I remember, too, when we went from the minivan and we jumped to the Ford Econoline 350, 13-passenger van, you know, what, you know, what are we getting in such a large van for? Well, it's so our children can invite their friends. So each one of our children can have a friend in the van, so that way we can do life Together, we can infect not only our children for God's glory, but also for uh, their friends as well. It was amazing. I remember once we went out camping. Uh, we have a son, Evan. He lives in California. And he, he invited one of his friends to come along on this weekend trip. And it was amazing because I remember we were sitting at the campfire. And to hear his story, he, he was a, a Mormon kid. And his sister had been ostr ostracized from the gathering, and we had this amazing conversation about God's grace with this young kid. He was a junior high, high school kid. And, and it was just profound, and he was just pouring his heart out to us, and we were just asking questions and listening and guiding him to gospel truth. These are opportunities that we have through our children into other families. And I would encourage you to take advantage of those moments. It's not, it's not formulaic, it's just from the heart. This is what we want to do. So be thinking especially about uh, our children and their friends and their families. And so uh, another, another way that we could influence children to encounter God. These are some of the, these are just pie in the sky ideas. These are ideas that I've been thinking about. I do not have the capacity to run with any of these now. I'm just saying that. Uh, but I want to share them with you just so you know that they're out there. Uh, there is a group called the American Heritage Girls that we've been a part of. 
Uh, our, our girls went through that. We actually started a troop back in California. There were about 40 girls, I believe, maybe 50 girls that were involved. It was a really special time. And so on Wednesday nights or maybe Tuesday nights, I can't remember which night it was, all these kids showed up and it was, it was messy. I mean, these little kids with colds and stuff. But I mean, it was still really great to have them there and to influence them in the way of Christ. There's also a great boys uh, uh, organization called Trail Life USA, boys. And, and this is a great organization that, that spun off from the Boy Scouts when they started getting kind of weird. And, and they got them back into to Christ-centeredness. And, and I, I often think, boy, I would love to be able to, to get my son involved in a, in a troop or something like that. And so we could, we could think about that. I'm just, I'm just tossing the seed out right now, okay? Just think about it. Think about what we're doing. Of course, the mission possible that's going to be happening this weekend. We've already heard the ex example of that. Also, by the way, I know that we are in the dead of winter. Okay, I get that. I, I mean, I've been, I've been thinking about how I could put myself in a box and mail myself to Palm Springs. Like I was, I was thinking about that just the other day. I was like, oh, Lord, please, please, Father. But, but the reality is that summer is going to be here soon. And when summer comes, everybody gets out of the deep freeze, and we live outside. And there are so many great opportunities to, to make connections with people, particularly during the summer, whether it be backyard clubs or backyard Bible clubs, or youth gatherings, or throwing things, par parties in your front yard for, for kids. I don't know, families, these kinds of things. We have opportunities to do sport camps, or family picnics, or church gatherings. I, I want you to be thinking about opportunities that we can gather, we can come together, we can, we can, we can make connections with others, other families, and be able to, to share the gospel message with them. The majority of people come to Christ at a young age. The majority of people do. And so that, that's our target audience. We need to be thinking about ways that we could, we could uh, do activities and programs and things to, to not only benefit ourselves and our families, but also the families around us. Can I encourage you, my dear friends? Can I encourage you this morning? Take family worship, take home discipleship, take outreach seriously. Take him seriously. This is, this is your greatest responsibility. This is your high and holy calling as parents, as influencers in this church. Let me read Deuteronomy 6. It says this. You're, you're perhaps familiar with this. This is, this is what every good Jewish person knows and is memorized this is the shema it says this hear o israel the lord our god the lord is one you shall love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might and these words that i command you today shall be on your heart listen to how they are to be on your heart you ready for this you shall teach them diligently to your children you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Basically, we are to be downloading the truths of God, the way to God, the life in God to our children, to those that we have influence over. Your faith your faith is, is to be uh, transferred. It's to, not transferred. It is to be modeled and, and is to be encouraged and should be held in such a way that others will want it. And so I encourage you this morning, lead your children, shepherd them, guide them to Christ. Again, as I said, this is your high and holy calling. This is your spiritual duty and obligation. And this is practical spiritual worship. Okay, so coming back to the text then. It says here, in, in, do not hinder them. Jesus says to his disciples, do not hinder these children, for to such belong the kingdom of God. This phrase, to such belongs the kingdom of God, is directional. It's, it's pointing at and describing the kind of person who will receive and be received into the kingdom of Christ Jesus. So the question then I need to ask is, 
who will be received into the kingdom of God? And the answer to this is whoever receives the kingdom of God like a child. So what are children like? Let me refresh our memory. This is what children are like. They are typically open. They are receptive to new things. They are willing to do adventurous things. They are emotional and, and they're free with their emotions. So they feel deeply. They feel great joy. They feel great sorrow. They, they, are, are, they emote so openly. And, and children, they are tender, aren't they? They're incredibly tender. They're compassionate especially towards others. They, they are clear thinkers. They're, they get confused easily, but yet they're very clear thinkers when they understand what is right and what is wrong. Um, they, they're typically not sneaky because they feel so guilty about it all. Um, they, their, consciences, uh, they convict, their consciences convict them very easily. If they sin, it bothers them tremendously. They're capable of telling you the truth effortlessly, Right? Does my breath stink? Oh, yeah, it stinks. You know, they will tell you very quickly about many things. They cannot keep secrets to save their lives, right? Perpetual truth tellers. Um, they are impressionable. They are trusting. They are believing. They are vulnerable. And this is very important. They are in completely dependent upon their parents, they respect authority, they fear authority, they're quick to obey and quick to please. So then let's come back. So what kind of person will be received into the kingdom of God? Well, it's someone who is dependent upon Christ Jesus. It's his grace that has, has saved them. By grace, through faith, in Christ Jesus. It's the one who trusts the Lord and is trusting the Lord. Didn't just say a, a, a magical prayer once a long time ago. No, no. It is consistently trusting the Lord, walking in his ways. The one who is open and receptive and obedient to the leading of the Lord as, as the word reveals and is guided by the Holy Spirit. The person who can pray with pure hands and a clear conscience someone who is forgiven of sin, who harbors no deep secrets, dark secrets. And my question to you is, are you this kind of child? Are you this kind of child before the Lord? Is this your posture? Does this describe your approach to Christ and your daily acts of worship? See, the Lord invites us not just adults, but also children. He invites us to receive his kingdom in this way, which is the only way we can enter it. He, he welcomes us and he will embrace us if we have this dependency, this enthusiastic dependency upon him. If we respect and fear and honor his authority, if we sincerely seek his truth, when we welcome his correction, his discipline, and his leading in our lives, when we submit to his authority, when we conform our will to his will, when we live joyfully under his sovereign rule. Boy, these are characteristics of a child of God. And, and while we participate in God's kingdom in this way, here on earth, guess what? We, we need to do all we can to lead children into the midst of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. We should not do anything that would hinder them, but instead help them to come to him. In the scripture this morning, again, as we keep going through it, he takes these children in his arms and he blesses them and he lays his hands on them. One of my favorite pictures of all time, I just saw it just recently, is of this young woman in the embrace of Jesus in heaven. I want you to look at that for a little bit. Think about your own children. Not just yourself, but also your own children. Maybe even your grandchildren. How about your children's friends? This is the picture of sheer joy. 
security, absolute peace, rejoicing. And our Savior offers this to us. Not only to us, but also the children amongst us. So what are you doing to make this picture a reality in your children's lives? What are you doing to make this picture a reality in the lives of your children's friends, of your grandchildren? There's no room for us to be in well-intentioned dragons. There's no room for us to be zealous gatekeepers. There's no place for us to be exuberant bodyguards at the expense of a heavenly reunion like this. Let's pray, pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, it's been good to spend time looking into your word intently. It's been very good, Father, to be challenged and spurred on as we develop a greater sensitivity to the needs of those around us. It's such a gift, Father, to be confronted with the necessity of becoming people who welcome and lead children in the knowledge and wisdom of you. And I hope, God, that in this short time we have been awakened, that we will be inspired, compelled to arise and become impactful influencers in the lives of children in our midst. Father, may we be quick to take care of our own families, but Father, may we also be just as quick to move out into the community in which you've placed us. We know that children are precious to you, O Lord. And because of this, pray that they would become very precious to us as well. So we give you thanks. We worship you and we praise you for the opportunity. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.